Speaking of reporters, the first gripe came three minutes into President Donald Trump's first solo news conference as president. From there, the president's criticism went from barbed to personal as he launched a ferocious attack on the media while defending his record during his first four weeks in office. Amid his stymied travel ban, replacing his Labour secretary pick and the fallout over the resignation of his national security adviser, President Trump chose to make the media a central focus of his press conference. Here's how John Sopel from the BBC feared in that briefing. Um, can I just ask you, thank you very much, Mr. President. Um, the travel, Where are you from? Uh, BBC. Okay. Here's another beauty. It's a good line. Impartial, free and fair. Yeah, um, sure. Uh, Mr. President. Just like CNN, right? Um, on the travel ban, uh, we could banter back and forth. On the travel ban, uh, would you accept that that was a good example of the smooth running of government? Yeah, I do. I do. Let me tell you about well, the travel. Were there any mistakes wait, in that? Wait, wait. I know who you are. Just wait. And that were some of the more lucid moments in that media conference. We wanted to find out what it was like being there, trying to get a question in. So we gave John Sobel a call and asked him what it's like working in Washington now when the media is perceived as and portrayed as the enemy. Unpredictable, unknowable, unimaginable. Every day you kind of wake up and you think, I wonder what will happen today. And this morning I woke up and thought it's going to be a quiet day in Washington. And I'm trying to finish a book. And I, thought, I rang the office and said, I'm going to work from home. And then I see a flash on the screen saying, Donald Trump to hold unscheduled news conference in an hour's time. And so I legged it down to the White House, uh, waited in the cold for 45 minutes until the Secret Service let us in, and then witnessed an hour and a half of theatre that you would pay good money for uh, if you were going to go and see it in your in the city, you know where you live. I mean, because it was extraordinary. It was uh, wild, unpredictable. He was savagely attacked the media, but you suddenly realise that he spends an inordinate amount of time listening and to the media, watching it, reading it, you know, but hates us simultaneously. Uh, he said we were fake news, but gave out some really dodgy statistics himself, which didn't bear uh, scrutiny. But he was in his element. I mean, this was Donald Trump unleashed, if you like. He was suddenly free to express himself in the way that he wanted to. Can you describe the experience of attempting to ask him a question? I mean, his immediate <laughs> he, 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 umbrage was he was just straight at you, wasn't he? And, and, and instantly attacking your employer. Yeah. So, uh, so, I mean, you know, I could take you through it. I start to, I, I, you know, I'm, thank you, Mr. President. I'm about to start. He hears my accent. Where are you from? So I said, well, I'm from the BBC. Oh, another beauty. Uh, so I thought, well, I, you know, I'm not going to just ignore it. So I said, well, we're free and fair and impartial. Great response. And he goes, and he said, uh, yeah, like CNN. And uh, I thought, I, I thought, well, hang on. I said, well, you know, we can we can stand here and banter all day if you want, but you know. And then I asked my question, and then I tried to ask him something. He goes, I know who you are. Shut up. You know, sit down. Sit down. And, um, and proceeded to answer the question. So it's not, I've, you know, I've got probably 30 plus years on the clock as a journalist. Um, I've covered politics in France, obviously in the UK, other places around the world. I have never experienced anything like this. But there again, I don't think anyone else, anywhere else, has experienced anything quite like this. And, and I don't know what question to ask next, because I think it's important we take this really seriously. And, and the overwhelming temptation is to treat it as some kind of farce, some fringe festival gig in Edinburgh, but it's not because he's President of the United States. And he's not playing to you, and he's not playing to me, and he's not playing to the audience listening to this interview either. He is playing to people who don't consume the BBC, who don't listen to CNN, who don't read the New York Times. He's playing to another audience entirely, and at some level, they like this stuff, don't they? Oh, oh, completely. I think that his base will have absolutely adored what they heard today. It was the Donald Trump of the campaign. He wasn't shackled. He didn't look awkward. You know, I've seen him doing those news conferences uh, with, you know, the British Prime Minister, Theresa May and Benjamin Netanyahu and Shinzo Abe, etc. Uh, and he looks like he's a constrained animal. It's not kind of what Donald Trump is. Today, he was completely unconstrained. But, John, you make a really, really important point. He doesn't like the media. Donald Trump is at his best when he has an opponent. When he has an opponent, he can bash. 
And so during the Republican nomination process, it was any of the other candidates, uh, low energy Jeb Bush, little Marco Rubio, lying Ted Cruz. Then it got to uh, Hillary Clinton uh, during the election campaign, and it was lock her up, lock her up. Um, and now he's governing. He's won, but he needs an enemy. And the mistake for the media to make now would be to think that we are the opposition. We are not the opposition. We are there to hold him as a politician, just like any other co politician, to account. And we do it fairly, and we do it impartially, and we do it reasonably. And we don't take umbrage, which is what some of the American networks have done, where you can almost see them bristling. Um, they've got a sense of entitlement, a sense of hurt, and I think it's a fatal mistake for us to behave in a way towards him any differently than we would any other political figure, because otherwise I think that the, the, the reputation of the media will go down even further. Yes, I think that's a very good point. And I'm listening to you, you as you say that, and I'm thinking, yes, the moment it becomes partisan, the moment it becomes polarised and tribal, then actually all your good work is lost because his side will never listen to it, right? I remember as a young political journalist uh, covering the House of Commons at Westminster, and a very old seasoned hand, who's long since passed away, said to me, remember this, it's about the Christians and the lions down there, but we are not players in the game. We may give a thumbs up and a thumbs down from time to time on who's done well and who's done badly, but we are not participants in the fight. And I think we have got to stay above the fray. There is a lot of fake news out there. There is a lot of people who don't know what to believe. I think for broadcasters like yourself, like the BBC, hopefully, if we can give people the news that is fact-based, that they are demonstrate demonstrable facts, that we don't have a dog in the fight, then I think we stand a chance. Otherwise, I think we could be swept away in endless Facebook posts of fake news, and I don't think that serves democracy well. That's John Sopel, who is the North America editor for the BBC, a brilliant journalist who we often run here on Checkpoint, talking about his experience of being at that Donald Trump media conference.